Yes. Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, first of all, congratulations on making it all the way through Saturday. I know it's been a hard week with all the sessions and conferences, workshops, the nights out here in Davos and, and the early mornings, especially on a Saturday. So thank you so much for being here. Um, we have an amazing lineup today. Uh, Univision and Fusion, this is the second year in a row that we can host a session. And we were very much interested in hosting this session this year. So. Uh, it's an honor for us to be here. My name is Enrique Acevedo. I'll be trying to speak as little as possible throughout the next hour so our guests and speakers can um, take care of that. Uh, I think we have a very large panel, so I won't be reading each, uh, you know, all, of, all, of, all of the bios. I encourage you to look at uh, the bios of our, our speakers. Um, I warn you, you'll be a little bit depressed with your own bio after doing that. <laughs> but. Uh, um, you know, uh, I'm going to start with a question, and, and I already talked about this in the green room. During the, my week here at Davos this year, I heard a lot about the future of technology and you know, uh, the challenges that we're facing as humanity. But I also got a sense that everyone is trusting or is overconfident that science and scientists will come up with all the answers that we Needs, need in terms of the, of the challenges that we're facing as, as humanity. And I, I just wanted to ask you if you think that's fair and if you think that's also accurate. I mean, it got us all the way here now, science. But from now on, do you think it's, it's fair that we are you know, aiming and, and, and putting so much pressure on science and scientists to come up with the answers? France Cordova, the first woman, the youngest, and first woman to ever be in charge of uh, the chief scientist position at NASA. Um, ladies first. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Enrique. And it's a real pleasure to be here on this panel. Um, I, I actually wish that people uh, had a lot of trust in science. I think we're at a point now when uh, people hear uh, so much and there are so many questions raised on uh, all sides of any uh, important issue that actually I think we're suffering from a, a lack of uh, trust in science, which we have to be very conscious of, and uh, establish through good research and good communications why people uh, should trust science. That's one point I want to make. Another, Enrique, is that, um, that we, I think we all appreciate that science and technology alone uh, cannot address uh, all of the world's complex problems, challenges. Uh, they can go a long way to providing tools and methods and enhanced understanding. But it's only the combination of the scientific knowledge we have with our understanding of sociology, of human behavior, uh, behavior as individuals, behavior as organizations, and with the, uh, the help and partnership of artists and designers and people aware of, appreciative of culture, that we can really approach and make headway on the problems of the world. Um, I don't know. We have an amazing lineup of scientists, but three of them are more now in charge of implementing science and very large budgets in some cases uh, that go to research and, and science. And on, on my left, I have three Nobel Prize winners. And I don't know if, Dr. Molina, you want to start by uh, following up on that. And sure. we talked about the expectations on science and climate change. Maybe that's right. also. Uh, right. Well, f first of all, I very much agree with, with Francis that si science is crucial and it's perhaps even underappreciated in, in many uh, uh, aspects of our society. Uh, first of all, what's very clear is that the, the countries that spend a significant fraction of their GDP on science and technology, they are the ones uh, that do better, their economies improve. And so that's a problem with many developing countries, that it, they're not spending enough, and so we don't have enough <coughs> high capacity uh, people to, to be able to push the economy further and so on. But uh, <coughs> I also agree that science alone is not enough. We need to be able to teach children, young adults, and so on, science, technology, but also values. And that's where it's connected with uh, improvement of, uh, of society, because science itself is neither good nor bad. But to put it to good use, we all have to agree that working together, we can improve things. In my case, climate change is a very good example. Where we know enough 
about it so that society should certainly already react very strongly. But science will help, on the one hand, to better sort of quantify the risks, which, which we think are very, very troublesome. And uh, furthermore, also to provide uh, solutions. We have many, but the point is also science with technology to, uh, to keep improving the prices, the costs, so that the society actually embraces uh, these solutions. So in a nutshell, science is, of course, crucial, but it's not enough. Crucial, but not enough. Uh, Constantino Boselov, you said uh, before we came into the stage, sometimes we are more pressured than the actual politicians that make the decisions behind well, the science. I guess I would like to be more optimistic about science than the previous two, two speakers. I think in, if you look at it at the long run, if someone is to provide solutions for the global problems, it, should, it is scientists, not politicians. Sorry about this. And, uh, but, and the most important thing that science, what it does, it, it provides us with answers and usually and the information, and those are true answers, unlike what you see on the news, whether you trust it or not, science, you always trust. Whether it's good or not, that, that's, that's another question, but the, the outcome of the science is the truth, and that's, that, that's, that's uh, how it is. And then it's, a, it's really a, a pressure on us, how do we use it? And uh, it, it would be really nice if we can use it responsibly. Then, of course, it's the human factor interferes. The, uh, now we need to, to convince our politicians on the issues of the, um, of the climate change. We need to argue to our politicians on the issues of the nuclear energy and so on, and that's also unfortunately a job for, for, for scientists, not only to discover new knowledge, but also to argue our case and to bring this knowledge to, 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 to the government. Uh, and I guess you deal much, much directly with politicians and uh, bureaucracy in, in, in your line of, of work. Uh, Francis Collins from the NIH, uh, do you think science is being put in that spot also in the US? I mean, locally, right now, for example, you're wearing that ribbon uh, for Ebola fighting in, in West Africa, but in the, was that in the case of Ebola, too much pressure being put on scientists to come up with a vaccine very, very fast to come up with a solution? There was pressure, there is pressure now. We haven't solved this yet, but it's appropriate. I mean, science in this case offers the opportunity to deal with a terrible human tragedy uh, with now thousands of people having lost their lives uh, to this uh, outbreak in West Africa. And the best hope to control that, a combination of really vigorous public health efforts to track down all the contacts and make sure that they're kept isolated so they don't infect others. But right now, the development of a vaccine, which in the next couple of weeks uh, will initiate a trial in Liberia and Sierra Leone to see whether, in fact, the evidence that looks very convincing from the monkey model and the safety data from phase one trials actually predicts that this will be an effective vaccine that's desperately needed. And this has been done in record time as far as getting it into clinical application. But I would say the Ebola vaccine was started at NIH as a project back in the 1990s when most people thought it was kind of silly uh, to put public uh, efforts into a disease that would probably never affect more than a few people in Central Africa. Uh, basic science is a critical part of what the scientific community can contribute. We have to pay attention uh, to that, that theme over and over again because there's a temptation, especially in medical research, to focus too much on that last translational step of getting something to the clinic. You're not going to have anything to get to the clinic unless you invest in that basic science understanding of how life works. And I have to say, for me as a physician, a geneticist, uh, the guy I had the privilege of leading the Human Genome Project, this is an amazing century for the life sciences. We are on a path towards uncovering answers to mysteries that we've never really had the chance to be able to approach before, and now we can. Whether it's understanding all the complexities of how that three billion base pair genome directs uh, the, how a cell operates, or whether, as we've heard about in, in Davos this year with many sessions, the ambitious effort to understand how the human brain works, the most complex structure in biology that we know of with its 86 billion neurons, each with which may have a thousand connections. Pretty bold and audacious to imagine that we might actually understand that. In fact, some people have worried that our brains aren't complicated enough to understand our brains, but we will have computational strategies to help us, and that's a good thing, too. 
I guess I would say, I mean, we have a panel here with people with lots of expertise. One of the themes that I hope uh, is, is coming across to anybody who's watching science is this idea of convergence that the physical sciences and engineering and the life sciences, which maybe used to be off in separate buildings doing separate things, they're all coming together now in a wonderful synthesis. It's all about understanding how the universe is put together, how that, uh, the understanding those laws applies to everything from the expanding universe to understanding how a cell does what it does. And anybody who wants to be a scientist in this century has to be ready to embrace all of those disciplines, including mathematics in a big way, including computational strategies. There's no room anymore, I think, for ultra compartmentalized, narrow perspectives when you have the opportunity to be much broader. And that I find very exciting. And it has this enormous potential to help us with the human condition. And again, as a medical scientist, certainly I think society does expect us to come up with those solutions to try to alleviate suffering, and that is part of our job. The death rate is still gonna be one per person. All of you need to be ready for that. Uh, but if we can increase the likelihood that your trajectory through life uh, has an opportunity to go forward without being prematurely cut down or limited by chronic disease, that's a noble enterprise. That's something science can be proud of taking on as part of our mission. Thank you so much. And now that you mentioned mathematics, Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, um, do you see this convergence happening to, you know, uh, across the globe, not only in a uh, place like the US? Well, I think uh, the point which has been uh, put uh, quite clearly is that there are uh, several stages. One stage is to understand, and the next stage is to find solutions. And of course, to understand, you have to rely on all possible tools for that. And uh, that's one reason why the sciences uh, actually come together. Because, uh, uh, I mean, many sciences have been built, in the, that's the case of physics or mechanics, really uh, only at the stage where mathematics was elaborate enough that you could have tools. But now there are really many other uh, movements the opposite direction. I think there are challenges coming from the biology, for example, to mathematicians, because all these huge uh, statistical data or data of the genome, uh, clearly this calls for new mathematics. So I think this stage of uh, uh, thinking of science as a uh, really a, a discipline altogether, which really uh, creates, uh, I mean, re I really insist on creates um, a new knowledge is very, very important. Of course, you hope that this new knowledge, which uh, allows you to a deeper understanding of the situation, will in the end uh, provide solutions. But I think you have to be very careful that if you just look for solutions without understanding deeply enough, then you can be really be at a loss. That's why I think it's uh, very important today to really see see that uh, fundamental science and applied science are not that different. So in particular, I think it's very, very dangerous to claim that you should not spend too much time on theoretical science and concentrate on applied science, because I think it's a, it's a dead end. I think you need to have both working together. And of course, quite often, fundamental science comes from a very applied question that you just cannot formulate and in the end you have to create new tools, new intellectual tools to, to really formulate the question. So I think this back and forth movement is extremely important and the back and forth movement of course involves going from one discipline to the other. So for young students today it's very important that they have a taste and they want to engage themselves in something but they must be aware that being in a silo is certainly not the solution for many of them. Maybe a few can, but most of them will have to embrace science more globally. Yeah, creation, a, a very interesting word and a topic that I want to go into detail. Ryan Smith, uh, the role of science in the maker's economy, in this new economic revolution where creators and entrepreneurs are basically kings as opposed to manufacturers or heavier industries. Um, the role of science in this maker's economy, how do you see it? Well, it's critical because when you're making something, you need to have information about how to make it. So when I look at the students I'm training, some of them are going off and trying to figure out how big the universe is. Some people are using the mathematics and the techniques that they've used to study that to go out and make and do things. And it's sort of a 50-50 split. So I think that base knowledge is critical. Uh, that science gives to be able to, to make the things and the people who have those skills are the people who are going to be very successful. Coming back to the fundamental tenet about science, I think that most people really do think science, even if in the short term they discount it, believe science is the future. I want you to think of movies about the future. It's called science fiction 
and I cannot think of a single movie about the future which does not have science and technology you know, as, at its core. So it's there, we know it. But we have to be careful because science is this great tool for taking knowledge and predicting things, manipulating the world. And it's our best tool for doing that. But it's not guaranteed to come up with solutions fast enough in all cases. So it is our best way to solve problems. And in the case of Ebola, it was very quickly, very quickly able to, it seems, to come up with a potential solution. But if we look at AIDS, well, we can put it at bay, but we don't have a solution, really, for that yet, despite huge amounts of money. And so I, I like to talk about, for example, gravity. Newton came up with gravity in the 1680s, and it took until 1915 to get the next method, 230 years. So let's say the solution for climate change takes 230 years to really do it. If we make the hurdle high enough for yeah. science, that would be bad because we probably don't have that amount of time. Not even close. Um, I'm going to open the, the floor to questions. There's the, only, the, the only rule we're going to have this morning is if you do, do want to ask a question, just do it very briefly and in the form of a question so we can get this interaction going and, and, and you, know, you have the chance to ask as much questions as possible. Dr. Marina, you wanted to say something? I just want to say something brief, but it, it is very important issue of uh, uh, applied versus fundamental science. And with climate change, of course, we know we can do, we have to do applied science, which is close to engineering, because we have problems at hand that we believe are, that they're possible to solve with energy and so on, uh, cheaper ways. But the, the very important question has to do with the role of fundamental science, particularly also, again, in developing countries, because they could claim, we don't have enough resources. Let's leave that to the rich countries. I think that's a bad mistake, because you need to integrate all this, as we heard uh, uh, very clearly. Furthermore, the, the one way you can guarantee that you will have really high quality scientists, technicians, and so on, is to have, to have uh, the people that do research, the professors, and so on, involved in the international uh, exercise of science. Fortunately, it's very open. We can do research with anybody in any country now with the internet and so on. So I just want to make that very clear that it is really important for developing countries not to sort of uh, <clears throat> pass the ball and just say basic science, oh, that's only the rich countries. Okay. That's a mistake. And I'd, like, I'd like to just add a word about gravity. So when, um, because we haven't heard the last word about it, and in 1915, when Einstein developed the theory of general relativity, today our cell phones work and communicate because of general relativity. That's what the global positioning system absolutely depends on. In spite of a movie, uh, referring to the comment about movies, uh, the theory of everything, wonderful movie. Wonderful movie. Uh, there is not a theory of everything. <laughs> and we don't understand how gravity, basic forces like gravity and the electromagnetic theory uh, converge. And there's just huge areas for uh, understanding, huge unknowns out there. So it's a it's very exciting world that we're in right now, where there's so much potential for young people to be engaged. And that could be another theme and, uh, that we could ask our audience about, is the, uh, the role of developing the entire world and including them. And with tools like social media and these cell phones, these very uh, uh, these little supercomputers in our hands, how do we engage the entire world of youth to be interested in science and engineering and technology and contribute? And, and prepare the next generation of scientists in this new uh, convergence, Constantine. I would, I would like to pick up on this point about the, uh, the science-driven economies. And one thing is, of course, that's very much true, that um, you can track all the advances in modern technology down to scientific advances, which has been done 20, 30 years ago. And that's a little bit of, uh, of a tragic that the, the scientific um, research works on the longest uh, on the longer cycle than the election cycle so we have to fight for, for the money with the people who don't get benefits from that and so that's uh, it, it's a little bit of a tragic but then um, of course yes we can track all the all the discoveries uh, all the technological advances down to certain scientific advances but we have to remember that 
uh, science, the product of science is new knowledge, which is most important, but in the morning, sometimes you don't want new knowledge, but you want a cross on, and then you want to open up your iPad and read some some news, even though if this croissant was produced with genetically modified crop or this <laughs> iPad was uh, got the most advanced uh, touch panel, you still need, need, need products. And you need this very smooth cycle which uh, supports scientific advances, but then we'll be able to translate it into technology as well. So. Uh, Professor Molina said that, that you cannot uh, allow countries just rely on production only. We cannot allow countries to rely on science only. There should be a very smooth cycle. I would see it as a pyramid with scientists on top. Sorry about this. I put, <laughs> I, I put myself there. But then, and, and then, uh, not. I mean, I huge respect to engineers and, and entrepreneurs. And then we just translate this knowledge down down the road to entrepreneurship-oriented people, to engineers, to the production. And there, there should be a coherent stream of, of, of efforts to solve the, 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 the modern problems. Thank you, Konstantin um, You know, I, I would cheat during the week. If I, if I saw any of you in line for a conference or a workshop, I would get on that line, because I thought that this is going to be interesting, maybe. So I wanted to ask you what caught your eye during the week. What are you excited about in the future? Uh, it has, maybe it's not something that has to do directly with science, which pretty much everything has to do with science, but um, something that technologically uh, advancement or something like that that caught your eye during the week. Uh, Brian Smith, can you recall something? So I, I've had the uh, disadvantage of flying in from Asia yesterday morning. So <laughs> I, you know what I'm always impressed with? You know, one of, the, one of the things that impresses me but scares me at the same time is the, is the development of uh, essentially artificial intelligence. And this is something I've been using in my own work for 20 years. And 20 years ago, it was really didn't work very well. But, and I used it only because of scale. Now, when we're using it, and I'm using the latest algorithms, some of them developed actually in industry as much as uh, any place else, uh, they're more consistent and better than I am. So they're a lot faster, but they're actually better. They don't make mistakes. And that ability to go in and do things that, you know, five years even ago, I just didn't think was going to happen anytime soon. It's amazing where that technology is going. But it's also scary because I don't think I'm quite ready yet for a computer to be a lot better at most things than I am. You know, I found it kind of disappointing when we couldn't beat the computer at chess. But that doesn't surprise me. It's very logical. There's a finite number of moves. But when you're getting to very complex questions where you can train it to be you know, as smart as anyone in the world on a specific task, it's only the next step where it can start figuring out how to train on generic problems itself. I was listening to Peter Diamandis from Singularity University. And he said that in the near future, a computer that we're going to be able to buy for $1,000, let's say, uh, is going to have the computational power of all the human brains in, in the planet. It's a scary notion. Well, it's a scary notion, but you have to be very careful with uh, what it says. Because uh, as a mathematician, I know that the progress of mathematics, of course, has been with the uh, ability to compute more things. But uh, the basic uh, jumps, I mean, really the major jumps, came from new concepts. And for the moment, uh, I've not seen really uh, computers come up with concept. Maybe that's the next stage, and I'm just uh, <laughs> it's too early in the process. But uh, it's very clear in the history of mathematics, the turning points have been all of a sudden people who understood that uh, there was um, a new concept to be uh, approached. And actually, in the case of general relativity, which was uh, alluded to with the 1915 uh, discovery, what was absolutely amazing was the ability of Einstein, next to also his neighbor, uh, Mr. Grossman in, at ETH Zurich, to really grasp the most recent mathematical theory which was available and to really transform it into a tool to understand the world. Because this theory was very sophisticated. And uh, even uh, the critical notion in general relativity happens to be uh, actually created by uh, an Italian mathematician, Mr. Ricci. And really, 50 years after the, the birth of uh, really uh, the geometry which was underlying. So it shows that uh, something which turns out to be absolutely critical and relevant for physics in the mathematical theory, which was created totally independently, actually came as a secondary object 
And, uh, but then for physics, it's the central object. So you see you, you have these interactions, and focusing on concepts is uh, something that for the moment the computer doesn't do. And so these really basic, uh, very critical jumps ahead for the theory uh, very often creates from really creative movements. And these creative movements can be erratic, because in, in particular in the example I was given of Mr. Ritchie, uh, his motivation proved to be absolutely leading to nothing. But it led to general relativity. And he, of course, not, didn't have this in mind. So you have these, uh, this phenomenon of a great interaction between all body of knowledge, but you never know exactly where you go. And you need this creativity. And this creativity is just for the moment still in the minds of people, not in the machines. Very interesting. Francis Collins. So certainly, uh, in terms of the themes at this meeting, and it fits right in with the conversation we're just happen uh, having, uh, the idea of being able to understand how the complex circuits in the brain do what they do uh, is one who's created a great deal of buzz at, at this meeting, and well, it should have. And I think it's fair to say that despite the fact that neuroscience has been working on this problem uh, for quite a few years, uh, we are still very early in our understanding of the real issues that you want answers to in terms of how those circuits work. We're pretty good at being able to measure what happens with an individual neuron, uh, how its uh, ion channels uh, determine whether it depolarizes or not in response to a given stimulus, be it a neurotransmitter or whatever. And we have increasingly good ways of looking at the whole brain uh, in people who are thinking about a certain thing or carrying out a certain task using such things as PET scans and fMRIs. But there's this huge space in between uh, the level of resolution uh, in between single or a few neurons and the whole brain that we have not had the technologies to really measure what's going on in real time. And that is now the focus uh, of this international effort uh, to try to understand that. And there are profound possibilities here in terms of getting answers to questions that right now we don't understand. How do you lay down a memory? Despite all the work that's been done on that, we really don't quite know what the molecular basis of memory is. How do you retrieve that memory? <clears throat> is it, in fact, the case that every time you retrieve it, you have to rewrite it, which means that the only memories you can really trust are the ones you've never retrieved? <laughs> that may be a certain truth in that, by the way. Um, how would you actually understand memory well enough that you could capture it and transfer it uh, to another individual? That is not science fiction. There are people doing that with rodents right now. And what would the social consequences be of the ability to carry out that kind of memory transfer? You can imagine it would be pretty useful in teaching you new tasks uh, without having to go through the usual process uh, of learning them the hard way. For me, as uh, somebody who really wants to see this applied for medical benefit, the ability to know how those circuits work may be our best shot at understanding autism or schizophrenia, or depression, or Alzheimer's disease, all of which are desperately in need of advances. Uh, and we're not going to get there without this convergence of disciplines. The NIH just put forward its first group of grants on the Brain Initiative, uh, $46 million, and they're all technology development. And most of the successful applicants wouldn't call themselves typical biologists. Uh, many of them are, in fact, engineers. And bringing together those disciplines with lots of computational capability is exactly what we need right now. So if you want to say, where's the frontier? This is one of them. I could talk about others like stem cells and uh, genomics and precision medicine. But the brain does seem to be at a moment in history that it might be a possible place to understand with enormous consequences, both medically and socially, and just in terms of our view of who we are and what makes us human. Uh, there are going to be lots of philosophical implications as well. My gosh, maybe we'll even understand consciousness, which is that big challenge Talk that about many next people have. Next frontier. Yeah, next frontier. <laughs>
France Cordova. Yeah, I look at this moment that Francis is describing as uh, equivalent to where we were at the beginning of the space frontier. I am a space scientist, and I am uh, today. I have my uh, the positions I've had because of uh, of our space enterprise and getting involved. And there we had uh, physicists and engineers coming together with new tools, new uh, technologies, and um, and they opened up the universe and got above the atmosphere with rockets and then satellites to make these amazing discoveries. So that now today, what we know we don't know, which is 95% of the universe, dark matter, dark energy, have come about largely, not exclusively, but largely because of these new technologies and opening up new windows on the universe. To go to your question, Enrique, about Davos, I think this is a question that all of us, as we return home and get back to our day jobs, will think about. What is the, what is the effect of Davos on, on me? After we get some sleep, of yeah, Yes, right, on, on the plane, perhaps, <laughs> as I intend to do. But uh, so, so clearly, each of us has a passion, and we resonate with hearing people talk about that passion. So for me, yesterday, when I went to Constantine's uh, a talk about um, using new elements of the periodic table and making uh, new forms of matter or molecular uh, interactions by uh, exploring, exploiting uh, the periodic table, the new matter that uh, he discovered, new form of matter of graphene. I mean, th this absolutely, you know, it awakens in me all my passion about looking into the heart of nature and trying to understand it at a very deep level. However, now I have a job where I'm in charge of the U.S. National Science Foundation, and um, we fund all of science and en engineering, exclusive of biomedical science. And my uh, job is to bring, enlarge that passion to uh, form partnerships that are crucial to exploring all of science and engineering and addressing the challenges that we're talking about today. So in a limited funding environment, and none of us has an unlimited funding environment, no matter where we are on the planet, that I, I believe that it is partnerships, public-private partnerships, for example, partnerships of agencies, of foundations, of individuals that will uh, exploit these new frontiers. And being very creative with those partnerships is incredibly important. And the last thought that I really wanted to mention, because it brings back to who I am and my background, what I've discovered in Davos, is the, um, the Latin American theme. And I have gone to as many of the sessions about Latin America as I can. So why is that? Most of them have not been about science. They've been about uh, bankers and uh, ministers and people who are in charge of the economy of Latin America, talking about how they can make uh, better policies to integrate across the countries and become stronger. But it, it is absolutely clear that Davos is an environment where science and technology can intersect with the economy and getting people together that understand how to um, uh, raise uh, young people, uh, give them more education so they can participate in this world of science and technology. And many of them, as we all know from our own children, will become uh, the bankers and lawyers and the people who are able to affect uh, policy change is just so important. So this sets the stage for that conversation. I think everyone comes away with an opportunity to be more expansive in their thinking about how we make progress. Okay. I, I know you have um, something to say, Dr. Molina, but I want to open the floor to questions, and we have one over here. So sure. keep that thought. Sure. No, that's fine. That's fine. Yes. Uh, my name's um, Peter Davis. I'm a professor of sociology from University of Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, I'd be interested in the, uh, uh, the views of the panel on the role of the social sciences, which have really had no mention at all. Um, in front of me here, I've got a, a copy of the global risks put out by the World Economic Forum. The top 10 global risks all have a huge social science element. So while we're talking very grandly here about the, the role of the, the natural and life sciences, it seems to me that when we're moving that next stage into the policy arena and 
translating the world of the academe into the world of, the, of politics, we ought to be looking at the social sciences. So how do the members of the panel see uh, the role of the social sciences vis-a-vis, -vis, in many ways, the physical sciences, it was the, were their big thing has been up in the 20th century, perhaps the 21st century is the role of the social sciences. Mm -hmm. I'd like mm -hmm. them to respond to that idea. Let's not overlook social sciences in, in this panel. Brian Smith, it's close to New Zealand, Australia. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those are fighting words. Um, so social science has a key role at ensuring that you know, the things that science does get used in a sensible way, get shared. And so I like to always say that science can solve problems, but it, it, it's not enough alone. It gives you the potential for answers, but then you got to get them out there. And so one of the big uh, problems that I see us facing over the next 100 years uh, is we have a, still an exponentially growing population that, you know, it's going to soon have 8 billion people. Uh, that could grow to 9, 10, 11, or 12 if we're not careful. We don't take care of the social science part of it. But we also have reasons to believe that the interaction of technology might slow that growth. But in order to use science, we have to have, uh, you know, lack of conflict. Conflict is what I see as being the big issue over the next 100 years. Uh, if we have times of no conflict, we can get science better down, technology better down to solve our problems. If we don't, we don't get that technology out distributed to everyone. People are going to be unhappy, and that leads to conflict. So I think that's an area where social sciences are going to be critical. But I do think it's a fairly separate issue to the science we do. But we, we do need these different things working together to solve the problems. And science has a very clear part of the problem, but it's not <coughs> sufficient on its own. Big implications for climate change in social sciences. Sure, sure. Let, uh, let me make the following comment. Sure. We, we were talking about before what Davos has done for us as scientists, but I want to put the question around. What have we done as scientists for the big problems that we're talking about, the World Economic Forum and so on? And since you referred to this document on, on risk, OK, and here is what I think we scientists have done a very poor job in communicating at least our science in terms of climate change to the public. It turns out that some of the science fiction issues or science uh, related to the brain and so on, it's so fascinating that uh, people absorb it. But when it has an impact on the economy, we're dealing with politicization of science and so on. But let, let me go to the point. The scientific community, there is a huge consensus that climate change is happening and that it's caused mainly by human activities. But there's also a consensus that there is a huge risk, and that's where the risk comes in, that if we continue the, the, the way we are functioning right now, we have a huge risk, one in five, one in 10, of enormous disasters. And that's not what people talk about at board meetings in the companies that are represented here at the, at the Economic Forum. We have one or two round tables where, or, or forums like this where the issue was faced and lots of recommendations were carried out. But my feeling is that the bulk of the companies, the bulk of the CEOs, it's a risk, but it's one in 20. Okay. And the, there are others that are much more important what's going to happen to the economy. No, if, if we scientists are doing a lousy job in terms of really communicating the, the extent of the risk we think we're facing. I think scientists and media, too, with clear exceptions, NPR is here, and that's, they do a great job in, in communicating that. Um, yes, I have a question, uh, the lady in the front, and then, the, the, oh, okay, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> You'll be next. Um, just following uh, on the theme of movies, there's another great movie that came out, which is The Imitation Game, and there was the, the scenario where there was a very, very urgent need to find a mathematical solution to a problem. 50 years later, we found out that actually, in the end, knowing and discovering this extraordinary enigma, uh, uh, the, the, the puzzle of the enigma machine, meant that we had, we had a role in, in the war of playing sort of God in terms of who, what we chose to reveal and what we chose not to reveal, and many lives were lost based on that to be able to win the bigger picture. Is, um, in a way, what I'm trying to say is that, is science going to um, discover uh, solutions that will have to sacrifice other forms of uh, climate well-being in order to make the overall progress 
in terms of climate uh, warming, I mean global warming, climate problems, destruction of the planet, are scientists going to be in a position to have to play God behind the scenes? Yes, Jean-Pierre Bourgogne. Yeah, maybe I want to take up the last question and your question together, because I think uh, they are, in a sense, uh, very much uh, connected. I think uh, in the case of the European Research Council, we have the advantage over my neighbors that we are actually all the fields together, that is social sciences, humanities, uh, life sciences, and uh, physics, engineering, mathematics, and so on. And I think uh, definitely very often, if you look at the projects that the scientists are proposing, uh, definitely there is a, it's impossible to separate uh, really the, the various components. So if you look at the, the issue you are putting forward uh, about the climate change, of course, there are a number of uh, elements which are strictly scientific in the sense of collecting data, trying to find, uh, understand some scenarios which are possible, and in particular, since you are talking about the future, some kind of uh, anticipating what could be possible scenarios. And for example, there is one thing which personally interests me quite, quite a bit, which has to do with the, the polar cap, with uh, the speed at which it's uh, at, at the moment uh, really disappearing, is um, even worse than any, any of the scenarios that people have been talk uh, talking about. But clearly, uh, these scenarios, they are just setting the stage. But then, of course, then you have to see these are, in, in, in a sense, uh, presented as uh, physical data or, or phenomena that you can describe. But then the impact on society is absolutely major. And then you, for societies, usually it means that something will be different. For example, uh, some areas will be uh, flooded, some areas, uh, some culture that people were used to make their life from uh, will be unavailable. So there will be a huge social impact. So clearly, uh, you cannot look at climate change strictly as a physical phenomenon, although you need to start from that. But then you have to look at, uh, at really also the impact on societies. But then the next, thing, say, next uh, stage is really to come up with decisions. And clearly for decisions, I mean, there is a political process for this. And the political process at the moment is very scattered. They are very different uh, stakeholders. And uh, it's very difficult to get the global community to agree on uh, where to go. And uh, you've seen that the conference in Copenhagen, the last one, uh, was definitely, from that point of view, not a success. I think that's an understa understatement. <laughs> so I think uh, from that point of view, it's clear that uh, we need uh, social sciences very, very much to understand the processes which can block uh, decision making, which can uh, really make it possible for people to understand better what is at stake, and uh, if possible, make them aware that if they no really so, uh, solid solution is proposed, then the consequences, which are not, they will not be hypothetical, they will be coming. But really to under understand how people can react to this. You cannot separate the social sciences from these scenarios. So of course the difficulty is that we are talking about scenarios. It's very difficult to be very, very prescriptive about what's going to happen. But now the, I mean, the, the, the accumulation of data is really such that clearly we, are, we will be confronted with major, major issues with fantastic impact on society. And you need people to help you understand. And this is the whole point of social sciences. And so I think uh, that's a typical example where if you don't take, get uh, on board all people, that is uh, scientists on one hand to understand phenomena, but also scientists to understand how societies react to phenomena. And then you also need, of course, that's the whole point of uh, Davos, to bring together also pe people on the political side to really make them understand that the decision they make will make sense only if they are really long term, if they are sustained for a sufficiently long period. So all these things really require so many different uh, components that, and if you miss one, you miss everything. So I think it's a very good example, climate change, of a domain in which the interaction of science with society is enormous. But for the moment, society has not been able, as a global society, to really come up with uh, the right structures of decision, the right process, and even making people understand what it is about is not so easy because typically we spoke fantastically about the new tools of internet but clearly some people are using internet to really actually disinform people so there is also internet can be also an, uh, an, a fantastic tool to manipulate people so i think we are in this very critical situation of the need to mix things and mix competence and get all people together but also they are quite big interest at stake. So people are also going to try and make this process derail. So I think this is a very, very typical issue where everything is there. Um, 
Just yes. very briefly, because I know we're thinking very long for this point. But <clears throat> again, talking about the World Economic Forum, what we need for to deal with with climate change is really working with science, technology, but economists as well. And the leading economists <laughs> working with us scientists, we, we agree it is clearly cheaper. It's going to be less costly for society to begin to face a problem realistically. It's a huge challenge. But the point is that the risk is just too large to ignore it. So economy and science and technology are working very closely together here. And it's for improving the state of the world. Okay? The answer is very clear. It will be uh, almost surely much cheaper to be in that. Um, I, I, sure. I want to be sure that the audience recognizes, especially because of the penultimate question here, that um, that we are funding social, behavioral, and economic sciences. This is one of the main areas that we do fund in the United States of the National Science Foundation. And just for, we, we fund risk and resilience, we fund work on the brain that is in the social and behavioral sciences, of course. And as one example of the last 51 uh, prizes uh, of, uh, in honor of Alfred Nobel for the economic sciences, of the last 51, the U.S. National Science Foundation has given funding to every single one of those. Wow. So there, there is a commitment. I'm not sure that that commitment is always shared uh, by Congress, which asks some questions. They are relevant, important questions. And I think the direction that they take us is that we, every one of us, not just in the agencies, but certainly out in the public, must make the case as strong as you've heard here, uh, especially from Jean-Pierre and, and Mario, that, uh, that the social, behavioral, and economic sciences are crucial to uh, address the challenges that we face on a global scale. We uh, have uh, two final me. questions, Constantine, just so we can go into our final round. But go ahead and, and make I, your I just to, uh, want to comment again that it's probably it's very big misconception that science can take sides and science can play God. So, no, uh, science only provides the true information. And it's the question, what do we do with that? So it's once we got it, it's people who play God, and scientists can only provide this, these truths, whether we like it or not, but that's how it is. And then it's up to us, what do we do with it? And if something is meant to be, if, if it is possible to discover it, it will be discovered. And then it's, uh, it's of course, is the responsibilities of the scientists to, uh, to give recommendations and educate our politicians and general public what to do with, with this knowledge. But it is really a responsibility of the society what to do with the scientific knowledge. Um, we have two questions, one on the back, and then we'll have your question. And after that, um, people are big on predictions here at Davos. So I'm going to ask for your predictions in terms of the future of science in 2015. So be, be ready for that, your question. Uh, David Christian, Macquarie University, Sydney, and I'm in the humanities. It's linked to these questions, but it's a question about specialization, institutional and scientific. Um, I think E.O. Wilson was arguing this sort of 20 years ago, that there's been fantastically successful research within the framework of disciplines for a century and more. Um, and that now we may be at a point in the evolution of science where the really interesting questions lie between disciplines or across disciplines. Now, if that's true, that means that one of the frontiers we face is institutional because the structures for interdisciplinary science, I know they're emerging in lots of areas, but the resistance, the institutional resistance to a genuine uh, research across multiple disciplines remains huge. I, I'd, I'd just like to hear some reactions from the panelists to that, 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 that question. Francis, I know you're dying to answer that question. Yeah, I think <laughs> your point's extremely well taken. Um, my own background is in physical science. My PhD is in, in quantum physics. It has been wonderful to see in the life sciences how the opportunities have emerged for disciplines to get together in ways that were not previously uh, so productive. The Genome Project was a good example. We never would have been able to sort out those uh, letters of our own instruction book without contributions from engineers and robotics experts 
from biologists, uh, particularly though from computational scientists, many of whom arrived on the scene with very limited understanding of biology because that had not been their focus, but got totally carried away uh, with the opportunity to sift through all of this digital data and construct from that real knowledge about life. And that has been a, a growing area of remarkable synthesis between disciplines. Uh, the same could be said about what's happening in neuroscience. Again, a lot of the most exciting science is not going to come from the traditional neuroscientists. It's going to come from the interactions between people who have different skill sets. But your point is very well taken, that institutions are not necessarily designed to encourage this in an optimum way. And that means that there have to be other ways of nurturing that. Um, and one thing that I guess we as funding agencies, uh, between the three of us here, uh, can do is to try to come up with mechanisms that make those kind of interdisciplinary uh, partnerships more likely to happen. Uh, I think it's been said that you can't herd cats, but you can move their food. <laughs> <laughs> and, and offering opportunities uh, for project support that requires uh, the applicants to come forward with clear skill sets that might not otherwise have joined together is something we're doing a lot of uh, at NIH. And I think with great uh, indications that it is reasonably successful. The other part of this though that's challenging at academics is how do you recognize the contributions of individual scientists who join together in these interdisciplinary teams, because there is also this mindset that your, your evaluation in terms of your productivity and whether you're gonna get promoted and whether you're gonna get tenure is about whether you are the senior author on a certain number of papers. Well, you know what? Uh, that's really not the way that science is currently going forward, at least in much of what we do in life science. It's these interdisciplinary teams and academic institutions have to figure out how to recognize excellence in the context of that kind of environment. Otherwise, they're going to lose out on encouraging the kinds of scientists that they really will need for the future. I think we're getting there, but your point's extremely well taken. Um, we've been live streamed, and, and now that Francis Collins just mentioned the magic word, cats, I'm sure this is going viral in the next <laughs> few minutes, but <laughs> Franz Cordova, you wanted to say something. I need a video to show right now. <laughs> Yes, so um, at the National Science Foundation, the way we address this um, uh, question of David Christians is that we fund uh, interdisciplinary research centers. So we don't have laboratories uh, that are standing labs like NIH and NASA does. 75% uh, of our budget of $7.3 billion a year goes to funding universities. And we have periodic calls about every year for either science and technology centers, engineering research centers, or industry university research collaborative centers. And we've been doing that for decades. And these are highly, highly interdisciplinary. It's, uh, it's just opened up to the greatest ideas. And we select them based on merit review of getting together experts and deciding what will be transformative, what's going to move us forward. And so this is on the minds of everyone, is really fostering this interdisciplinary research. And the other thing it gives is for students, for young people, and I keep coming back to this theme, it gives them the opportunity to be with scientists from physics and chemistry and social scientists and artists and designers and all, and drive towards new problems. Thank you, yeah, I can add a voice from the grassroots if you want. So it's generally what you see is the most successful scientists are those who switch topic and bring new, fresh region into, into a, a new topic, a new, a new direction. Of course, things are becoming more and more complicated and to learn every new um, subject takes more and more time, and, and that exactly would encourage collaboration, cross-disciplinary co collaboration. So it goes quite naturally, and, and we see it more and more now. Disruptive scientists. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> One final question. I'm Nick Goldman from the European Bioinformatics Institute. Um, we've heard this morning that the future of science is clearly international and uh, you know people working all over the world. It, it also seems likely in many fields of science now that the future is involves what is often called big data in you know, many different areas of science are generating more and more information by doing bigger and bigger experiments and I wondered if anyone on the panel had some comments on how we enable the experimental infrastructures that are going to enable us to do this kind of science all over the world and share all the information so it's best used 
um, experimental infrastructures and increasingly data into infrastructures. Maybe artificial intelligence, you were mentioning that, Brian Smith. So, uh, you know, in astronomy, we do share the infrastructure, and uh, one of the great reasons astronomers do that is we always know that uh, if we don't hang together, we will hang separately because the average politician doesn't think what we do is of particular relevance today. Uh, I would argue counter to that. So you can share things, but this infrastructure is expensive. Uh, sharing the data turns out not to be so hard, and so when you are planning uh, experiments, and let's say you need to build an experimental apparatus that is going to, you know, sequence the genome 10 years ago when it was very expensive, do you really need to have that everywhere or just you want to do it once? So I think you can get around a lot of the issue by sharing the data, but ultimately it comes down to can you afford uh, to put that infrastructure in various places around the world, and is there a reason to do it? So I personally find in astronomy, we have decided we put the telescopes where they should be, which is in high deserts, and we don't have them. The new telescopes aren't being built in optical astronomy in Australia, for example. Uh, but we do share the data. So I, I actually think sharing the data in most cases is sufficient. Yes, Jean-Pierre Bourgogne. Yeah. Yeah, so I think you're putting your finger on a very, very important issue, which has to do with uh, a new approach, which of course is very dependent on technology. I mean, the fact that one can collect and organize data is connected to the fact that we can actually handle them. And so, of course, uh, this um, new horizon is directly connected to the uh, capacity of uh, computing and uh, also collecting data. But uh, again, this is a typical instance where uh, I would look at this as uh, some kind of experimental thing, but then you have to come up with some kind of theory behind. And for the moment, I think uh, there are big challenges to statistics, which because that's, these data have to be organized. What kind of patterns can you identify? And uh, typically, one thing which I know in some disciplines, in particular in biology, would be extremely important is that the, the data, which tend to be very numerical, some of these data are actually naturally images. How do you do a statistics of images? Advantage of numbers, they, they are ordered but an image is not ordered. So how do you sort out uh, information from a uh, global information from an image? So this is a completely new domain, which is a, al almost a case where you, you completely lacking the theory. Because when you reduce an image to a, a sequence of pixels, you just kill the structure of the image. So how can you retain such a structure, deal with it, organize it? And so clearly this opens at the same time, of course, big challenges in terms of uh, amount of data you can collect, uh, but also how do you organize it, what kind of pattern you can identify in them. And this is, of course, for mathematicians, a, a great challenge. In particular, it's a great challenge because in many countries, in, in, in particular my own country, France, statistics has for a long time been considered as some kind of a small part of mathematics, which I think was, was not the right attitude. And so now clearly statistics or dealing of data is, is really becoming a very central object of study for science altogether. And I think this requires new approaches, uh, probably, again, as I said, new breakthroughs. Uh, and the breakthroughs will have to do with uh, new theories. And nobody has been able to come up with that. Francis Collins, before we go to the predictions round. Well, very quickly, uh, Nick Goldman, being a computational biologist, full aware of the fact that biology has really arrived in the big data zone. Uh, we used to be small potatoes compared to the astrophysicists, but we, we get respect now. Uh, just the Cancer Genome Atlas project produced about 20 petabytes of data, and we're trying to figure out how to store it and make it available to everybody. It's the most critical thing I think you could imagine right now in terms of the life sciences is how do we organize our data science efforts. It's enormously exciting. If I was starting out right now to do something in life science, I would want to be a computational biologist because they're the ones that are going to have the most fun with all this publicly accessible data that needs to be mined through and discover all those nuggets of truth about how life works. Okay. Brian Smith, um, your predictions for 2015 and the future of science. So the whole point of science is really not being able to predict the future. That is, you know, Einstein said, if we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be called research. So, uh, and I, 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 it's to me rather scary to try to make a prediction. I hope, for example, in my own field, we may discover dark matter in 2015. I think there's a chance. Uh, we may see one of the first stars of the universe. That's something I'm trying to work on. 
But what I do predict is that in 2015, there will be discoveries made that I cannot contemplate that will have a long-lasting impact on society that 100 years from now will be remembered and will define 2015. And I'm not sure if that's true of any other discipline. Uh, I think that's something we can all hope for. Constantine. Well, that's, that's very much true. When we put a grant application, we always put a roadmap for, for, for our research, but the hope for every single scientist to find something off the road and something unexpected, and which is which is completely uh, outside of the of of the of the expectations. Uh, well, there are certain trends in in the area where where I work, uh, which, which are probably related to quantum states of matter and the um, topological states of matter. Uh, but what came as a result of today, just to reflect of of the on the today conversation, we will see more and more convergence between different areas of, of science, and I would put uh, a lot of expectations on uh, nanomedicine and nanotechnology technology uh, being used in, in, in life science and in medicine. I think that there, will, there will be quite a lot of breakthrough there. Thank you so much. Dr. Mario Molina. Okay. In, uh, in my own field, I have to do understanding how the planet works, the climate. I think there, there's a lot of very interesting research that that can give uh, important results, such because uh, climate is a very complex system. So what's the role of clouds and feedbacks, the role of atmospheric particles? There's a lot of fundamental science, very important, very interesting. But there's another component to climate change which, should, which has to do more with the solutions. And there, part of it is perhaps just engineering, better, cheaper forms of uh, coming up with renewable energy. But basic science still can play a very important role, for example, with new materials. There's a, there's a need uh, to store energy, for example, which is very clear. It, maybe we still need a breakthrough somehow or other with new materials. And th there's a need to, uh, to really make fusion work mm -hmm. as, as a practical source of energy. <laughs> that, of course, has been going on for, for years, but it's, it's another example where fundamental research could eventually lead to very important solutions for the benefit of society. So I think it's both the very applied, fundamental, and uh, working in this sense that, uh, that we need science to help us to, to deal with these huge problems that society has. Thank you so much. Uh, a prediction for 2015, Franz Cordova. Well, I'm looking forward to run two of the CERN accelerator in Switzerland when it uh, uh, turns on uh, at uh, a much higher uh, energy in May that it will challenge the standard model. That would be disruptive. I'm also <laughs> looking forward to uh, this debate that we had last year, which was profound about the first uh, moments of the universe when it inflated tremendously and uh, the scientist using a big telescope in the South Pole uh, said that perhaps we were looking at the imprint of gravity waves on the microwave background and so we were re imagine getting information about the very first you know, 10 to the minus 30 seconds of the universe and then the Planck scientist from the European satellite Planck came and said no no what you're really looking at uh, is dust emission from our galaxy so this is one of the great debates I mean you know the debate about the first moments of the universe that's Fantastic. Maybe this will be resolved this year. But going back to the last question, a, uh, a kind of hope, because again, it embraces all the people on the planet uh, for 2015, is that some of these big databases that we are starting to assemble, and I, I look at Galaxy Zoo as being one example of that in astrophysics, are opening the knowledge of the world to people everywhere. And I'm a huge proponent of citizen science, and just as Galaxy Zoo has yielded discoveries from the school teacher in the Netherlands, for example, a new class of astrophysical object, I'm thinking that databases and oceanography and astrophysics and biology, there may be somebody, you know, a child or a person who is not a scientist on the planet, but is engaged and is curious, will make a seminal discovery. It wouldn't be a televised session without time constraints. We have just two minutes to wrap it up, but your prediction for 2000 
2015, Francis Collins. Uh, there will be advances in understanding fundamentals about how the brain works that we don't previously know about. Uh, there will be advances in precision medicine, and I would predict <coughs> at least a couple of dramatic cures of cancer that come about because of new approaches in the immune system or in genomics. And I would hope and pray this will be the year where we end the outbreak of Ebola with both an effective vaccine and effective therapeutics, and I think there's a very good chance we'll achieve that. Thank you so much, Imperial William. So for One 30 minute. seconds, um, I, I think uh, for, for the year 2015, it's very important that the scientists in the world really can uh, again get uh, more um, access to, to their initiative, uh, um, and which is uh, in many countries in recently, because of the difficult situation, uh, actually uh, the access for resources has been really very limited. So I think it's very important that we get on a new stage where really initiative for scientists is really on the table. We are trying to do that in our, in our case, but uh, it's very important that this is understood that the way to go forward, that is to trust the people and really give them the, the means to really look freely at what they want to look at. Hopefully we'll meet again here in a year and go through their predictions and hold everyone accountable. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you to the audience. Thank you.